Perfect. Hello, welcome all. And welcome to the second session of the series of conversations called uh, the Dismantle Museum. Um, that is intended to be a series of conversations proposed by Inland going beyond this edition of Documenta regarding the ways in which representation, intervention, and knowledge production have been skewed from the institutional perspectives in the one hand, and the ways in which community and independent initiatives have responded to it, creating liminal spaces, dialogues, and tensions in which many alternative practices uh, have settled. And this afternoon, we have the log to have among us Teresa Morales from the community uh, community museums in Oaxaca, and Azul Gonzalez, uh, who's an academic working in, in the area of the UK, Sandra Rosenthal, an anthropologist working from Mexico, and Liliana Pasima in Romania. We're going to properly introduce each of you, but welcome and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, just, uh, just a little introduction on, on this afternoon's uh, table, um, and which we will be reflecting on the how the museum sector has with, witnessed uh, the insurgence of multiple claims for decolonizing its practices and methods. And this preoccupation has to do with the recognition of knowledge systems as inherently skewed by those who control the site and means of knowledge production. This reflexivity shifts uh, the focus away from the universal towards a more specific uh, ways to uh, address uh, epistemology. And the conversation will revolve around the question of legitimate, legitimate uh, representation through different projects powered, by, powered and on by the community. Uh, and we will be looking at practical examples in which this is happening in different parts of the world through your uh, fabulous work. I'm going to give you Fernando Garcia Dori, uh, creator of Finland and or host um, for these series of conversations and and this participation in Documenta. And well, thank you, Fernando, for this opportunity. Thank you, Sofia. Thank you for putting this um, extension of the seminar uh, with these two sessions together. Um, thank you everyone for coming here and uh, for our guest speakers, thanks as well. Mm, you are not here in the room with us, but um, somehow your presence is in the exhibition uh, through different works and references um, in the spirit. And uh, you cannot see that we are in the workshop room of the Natural Science Museum here in Kassel. And in the floor there is like a sort of a four um, with different objects and natural objects. I just wanted to highlight that these objects are part of the collection of the Historische Sammlung of the Museum. And the, the Department of Collections works hands to hands with the Educational Department and gives them access to the objects to activate all kinds of workshops with kids and, and with different audiences and, and ages, age groups. And I find that already very much in the line of what we will be discussing today. That is the, the need to, to, to rethink you know, the relation between the, the collected object, the material culture that uh, happens to, to be to end up in the museum, the museum as an artifact for display and, and, and production of knowledge and dissemination of knowledge and the, and the subject of that knowledge and the possibility of having more of a, of a support uh, a structure to the continuity of the, the cultural life you know, of, the, of the communities where we are talking about. Uh, in this case, um, for the installation in, in the inland space, we are focusing very much on the uh, peasant and indigenous uh, cultural heritage. So um, I wouldn't like to take more time uh, on this introduction and actually to have the chance to, to exchange with Lila Pasima. Uh, Lila Pasima is an artist herself, as well as curator in the National Peasantry Museum of Romania in Bucharest. The interesting thing um, about um, the, the way in which uh, Lila uh, ended up in this panel is also that she has been uh, the, the, the main agent to make possible the exhibition of an important piece of the collection of the National Peasantry Museum of Bucharest that is in the exhibition space here in Documenta. is the reproduction of a monastery um, that actually was a central piece 
both for her and for me, because she was telling me that the first time she started to work in this museum, uh, she was asked to collect this piece from a village, from a nun's convent. And I also visited in 2018. And, and I think that the fact that you were a disciple of Bernie Auria, the director of this museum, uh, give us a chance to access his world and his view on how to transform what would be a traditional folklore museum of popular arts or folk arts into something more, no? into a, a window to the, to the worldview and cosmovision, if we can use this uh, Latin word, uh, of the peasantry of Romania. So thank you, Lila, for making time and for being with us, also bringing the peace. Thank you also for your invitation. Thank you. So, uh, can I start? Yes? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I tried. Okay. Um, am I, uh, am I hurt? It's okay? Yes, we hear you well, Lila. Please, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, First of all, thank you for your introduction. I'm really uh, pleased and enchanted that um, uh, you made possible our meeting um, in Inland uh, project. Uh, and uh, because the time it's really short, I, um, I want to take account of, um, to make a, a visual, uh, concentrated essay of uh, what it's mean um, Romanian peasant museum, what is mean curating the past in the vision of uh, Horia Berna and uh, his team. And um, I, uh, because I'm also an artist, not only a curator, I wanted to have uh, as in a mirror, uh, what uh, we are doing with um, this kind of uh, self perspective, self ethnography, um, due to an um, European project from uh, Europe Creative, um, which uh, took uh, place in 2015 and 2019. So um, I uh, will start with um, that. Okay. I will start for the, uh, with the first um, years of um, rediscovering um, the vision of uh, National Museum uh, of uh, Romanian peasant. Um, and uh, because we had a very complicated history, um, I want to reflect a little bit uh, how it started and um, uh, how it was uh, interrupted and dismantled on the communist period. And um, of course, to speak about uh, the renaissance of uh, its collections uh, and uh, the completely innovative vision of uh, Horia Berna after the revolution. So you, you see the, the buildings from uh, the first, the beginning, uh, the 1906, so from the beginning of 20th century, it was uh, a special national contest of architecture, um, specially imagined for uh, hosting the Museum of National Art. And uh, you can see, um, uh, a brochure of uh, museum of uh, history of um, worker party, the future of the future uh, communist party, uh, which um, dismantled the museum in 1953 and replaced it with um, the communism um, uh, artifacts, um, historical, um, um, achievements and uh, the new um, layers of um, um, victorious society, you know. So you can see uh, at the beginning of 90s, we had to uh, reconstruct and rebuild the display of uh, the museum. Uh, and we had to 
uh, deposit all the communist artifact, which were which in fact replaced the the um, folk objects from um, the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century. And uh, this is, um, uh, in fact, the, the object, the principal actor of uh, our meeting with the uh, Inland Academy, this uh, small um, monastery, a uh, model of monastery, uh, which uh, was seen also by Fernando. And uh, of course, he wanted so much to have it in, uh, uh, in inland concept uh, display. Um, and uh, very, br very briefly, um, it was my first mission, the, the, gallery, the gallery, it's entitled Windows. And it started from the idea that the monastery as a center of spirituality, it's a window open to divinity because the culture, uh, the peasant culture, uh, it's um, very profound based in uh, this uh, relation of, um, of, the, of the peasant with uh, divinity, with God. Uh, and uh, the, the maquette was uh, founded by Horia Bernia, the um, director of the museum. He was one of the most important uh, cultural pers personality of uh, 90s uh, with a uh, uh, background uh, in architecture, in uh, history of art, uh, in uh, arts and physics. And uh, he saw it in, uh, in a field in uh, Coventry of nuns and um, he told me, okay, you have to go there and to buy it or you have to, to, to come with uh, it. So uh, uh, both with uh, my colleague of research department, I went there and uh, we, uh, we found that in fact, it was um, um, a maquette uh, made by a um, former, a monk, because in 1958 the uh, the communists um, um, closed uh, all the monasteries and they uh, um, stopped the the functioning of uh, the cult uh, uh, really and religious um, rituals and in uh, in monasteries and uh, he became uh, the volunteer of um, this uh, nuns uh, from uh, Gigiu monastery somewhere in the south part of Romania but uh, returning to to our museum uh, in fact what is really important to know uh, that uh, in 90s uh, it uh, the Horia Berna came with a very different vision of um, uh, museography. Um, he, for example, he um, he was opposite to everything. It's mean uh, classical ethnography with uh, the scientific information. We were uh, entitled at that time as a museum um, without labels because. He uh, thought that uh, the world of uh, the peasantry culture, it has to be felt um, by um, uh, effect, yes, uh, by emotional state. Uh, he imagined a poetic of museography and he believed a lot in the power of the object, the power of the object and the direct relation between object and uh, visitor. And uh, in fact, we had some scientific informations uh, where uh, they, they were put it and placed in uh, some um, pockets uh, from textile pockets. Uh, and for those who wanted uh, so much to, to find, in fact, the history of the object, the place, the um, uh, anthropological, in fact, context, uh, they can uh, use the, um, this kind of information, uh, but not disturb this um, whole and this organic, in fact, um, um, conception of uh, what is mean peasantry world. Uh, and you can see, in fact, how uh, free uh, he imagined the relation between objects uh, themselves. Um, he, he didn't 
uh, rearrange in ethnographic um, territories or in a historical um, uh, perspective. But uh, always keep in mind that uh, the beauty of the object, uh, it's more important and the, the sense of um, spirituality and uh, of the uh, importance of the uh, manuality of the crafts, it's, it's more re relevant than uh, the um, historical information. Um, so he had the courage to um, overlap or to put together a very uh, usual and uh, humble uh, can of uh, modern can um, uh, near, very near to um, uh, an object from patrimony, which is considered uh, uh, as is our result, a treasure, you know? So um, uh, he also um, articulate each uh, kind of um, gallery, of structure of the gallery uh, in an organic way, because he entitled also each gallery uh, in um, uh, profound meanings of peasant lives. For example, power of the cross, beauty of the cross, um, luxury, um, triumph, um, icons, um, re, um, the relics, uh, windows. So um, he also uh, believed in um, that um, state of um, spirit that the museum, it's an alive space, an active, in fact, uh, a place uh, in which the visitor has to interact directly with this um, world. And uh, he also wanted to balance uh, the fragile object with uh, the powerful object, iconic objects, like this uh, windmill, for example, water mill, for example, and windmill, which um, placed like this, it's, uh, it became an uh, iconic uh, also uh, stamp for uh, peasantry architecture, you know, and uh, he was always interested in the monumentality of uh, the object, the seriality, but in the same time, uh, he recreated the context. Uh, he always said that we, we have to um, imagine with the force, with the power of the contemporary instrumentary, um, the profoundness of the old world of uh, the peasant's life. So uh, he re-enact contexts um, with this kind of witnessing image. Uh, he always uh, put together uh, the clothes, the beauty and the refinement and the elegance of, um, uh, but, but always um, balanced with the simplicity of the peasant object with um, this kind of uh, memory of image, uh, which is uh, photography. Um, I told you that about the dismantled uh, museum and the, uh, in fact, the um, heavy and um, very deeply uh, fra fragmentary um, intervention of communist party and the communism uh, uh, attitude in um, uh, thinking of uh, peasantry civilization and peasantry society. Uh, and we have uh, in, uh, in the uh, downstairs in the uh, uh, subsoil of the um, um, display exhibition, we have this kind of political installation called Plague, uh, in which uh, we uh, wanted to express, um, in fact, the demagogical um, um, attitude and perspective of what is mean new world of uh, and uh, equal world of uh, uh, worker um, uh, society. 
Um, and uh, because um, I um, I had the museum practice of Horia Berna in 2009, I started uh, some experiments, um, so-called experiment um, by Vintila Mihailescu, one of uh, the former uh, director of, museum, of the museum, who is also passed away. Um, and uh, I wanted to continue this relation between uh, ethnographic text, um, the power of the objects from the uh, patrimony collections, but also the uh, anonymous object and autobiographical object, and to put together um, for get that freedom of uh, state, um, an artistic state, uh, to um, convince the visitor that sometimes it's uh, better to feel uh, the, um, the peasantry and the folk art uh, looking directly at the object and uh, with not an intermediary of um, uh, scientific information on conservation uh, protection, you know, which sometimes kill the, the meaning of the object. And uh, I create all times uh, layers, uh, put it together with uh, um, text from uh, the folklore, with um, uh, sociological, for example, um, informations, uh, with uh, photographic, uh, witness photographic um, um, proofs. And uh, of course, uh, architectural display, which I imagined myself. And um, like uh, here, I introduce um, also um, some uh, sound performances with uh, collaborators from um, musicians of New World Music um, that I integrate uh, to create uh, an enlarged perspective of uh, uh, understanding um, the, the peasantry culture. And also, uh, always I um, balance the, um, the 19th and the 18th century of uh, starting and, uh, um, you know, the beginning of the peasantry art with uh, the communist period and uh, with uh, the, the um, uh, true of uh, contemporary um, a period of uh, 90s and uh, 2000 years, with a lot of transformations also in uh, uh, agro agriculture, ecology, uh, understanding the dynamic of traditions, um, uh, the new the new perspective and the new uh, rethinking uh, of uh, what is mean an artifact and uh, the also the. Um, continuation of uh, tradition. So um, I, I work uh, a lot with, uh, it's like a palimpsest, you know, uh, when um, uh, with a lot of layers, you uh, develop the story um, also of uh, the uh, artifacts from the collections, but also with the stories of communities, uh, with the rituals, with uh, superstitions, you know, uh, this is an um, uh, exhibition called the um, Art of Passing. Um, passing, it means passing uh, all the rituals in life from the birth, uh, baptism, uh, marriage events, um, different celebrations uh, of feasts uh, and rituals, peasant rituals, and uh, of course the death and the meaning of death and all these kind of relations, uh, which has to empower, in fact, uh, not only the importance of the collections, but also the importance of uh, all this uh, anthropological, in fact, uh, uh, substance uh, for the community. Uh, and uh, now, because I think we don't have so much time, uh, I want to, I, I put it in the mirror, um, what I understand by self-ethnography and what I practice, um, it was 
I told you about uh, an European project um, sponsored by uh, Creative Europe program by com European Commission uh, that took uh, four years um, uh, through all Balkans territories. And it was dedicated uh, to all the communities in, um, in uh, Balkans area. For uh, example, in Romania, for a Romanians, an ethnic community group, uh, which is really uh, close to Romanian people. I am also an a Romanian, so uh, I was uh, tempted to uh, rediscover the self-identity and also the self-representation of uh, our old, um, of our grandparents or grand-grandparents of our ancestors. Uh, we, are, we were four um, partners, uh, Romanian National Peasant Museum, University of Paisi Hilandarski from uh, Plovdiv, Bulgaria, uh, the Central uh, Intercultural Center from Northern Macedonia, a uh, private uh, organization, ONG, and uh, from Tricases, a social and um, anthropological study lab uh, from Tricase, the south part of um, uh, Italy, Puglia. Uh, we all um, took uh, the research fields uh, about uh, a Romanian group ethnic, about uh, Serkacen uh, ethnic group from Bulgaria and, uh, and from uh, uh, several ethnic uh, cultural groups from uh, Northern Macedonia, Albanian, Turkish, Jewish, um, Roma community. And uh, from Italy, uh, we studied Mito community, a peasant community, which um, in fact has um, a similar polyphony music as uh, a Romanian and Circassian community has. Uh, it was really an uh, empowered um, experience with uh, two years of research field with uh, 47. You, you, you have here the map of the Balkan territory in which uh, we'll, um, we, we've done our um, cultural product of um, our um, European project, starting from um, internal uh, meeting, management meeting, uh, workshops, uh, itinerary exhibitions, uh, theater play, uh, ethnographic and anthropologic video, uh, five studies uh, or six studies, um, several um, catalogs of the exhibitions, a uh, site and uh, an archive, the first archive of um, South uh, Eastern Europe uh, of this uh, ethnic uh, group, and a lot of uh, a lot of other uh, um, other uh, products. Uh, so we started from this point of uh, of our travel. It was uh, we entitled the project Kutenda. We spent. Um, because we uh, imagined uh, everything as a visual essay, a journey uh, through all um, uh, villages uh, uh, from Balkans area, uh, where we could discover uh, the remains of um, this ethnical group with uh, old people, with uh, the new generations that uh, were uh, very aware to reconstruct their, um, their uh, habits, their rituals. Uh, some of them, they uh, continued all these years uh, during the Communist Party in the, in the family, um, uh, in the family um, habitat, you know. And they started as shepherds and uh, as a semi-nomadic population. And uh, after colonization, they uh, settled uh, in uh, different uh, uh, villages and towns uh, uh, in Romania, for example. They became doctors, lawyers, um, jewelry, uh, uh, craftsmen, um, uh, the bankers. Um, so, we, uh, we challenged, you know, the memory 
uh, tools with uh, reenacting the the um, folk costume, which is really um, fond of Oriental, you know, and Byzantine uh, style, uh, balanced with um, the um, out of tone and um, particular and individual um, for each group, ethnic group. Uh, they uh, knew very well to combine the simplicity, uh, the rawness of the material with the elegance of the embroidery. Um, you can see this is the tent. In fact, this is the middle, the counterpoint of the whole uh, project. Uh, the starting point of our symbolical um, uh, travel around Balkans. And we have also the um, instrumentary of um, utilitarian artifacts of the community. We had the um, uh, witnessing image, uh, oversized, and uh, also the modules of uh, places from where we were all around the world. We have the um, archive um, oversized um, slides and prints from uh, Manakia brothers. Manakia brothers were a Romanian uh, photographers, the first photographers in uh, Balkans territory, and also the first uh, video uh, makers uh, in uh, Southeastern Europe. Um, so, and to, to end with uh, this continuity of what I understand by self-ethnography, I imagined a road trip uh, starting from the end, the end because my mother, it's, it's the end of uh, her story. Uh, now um, I wanted to make, a, to, to go back to his uh, micro, -hist her micro history and to re, Imagine the whole, uh, the whole uh, journey, a difficult one with colonization, with deportation, with uh, losing of uh, four uh, homes and uh, with surviving. So she, she learned a lot and very well to survive and to, to be alive and um, a fresh, with a fresh and uh, Beautiful uh, thinking. Thank you, Lila. Maybe we have to start. Uh, I, will, I will. I will make just a short overview. Yes. Now. So it's the history of my grand grandparents, yeah. the deportation. After the deportation, the communist time. The three generation. Nine, the, the 80s, everyday life, the traditional and iconic uh, pie of uh, a Romanian ethnic group, my interventions in uh, Moscow Initiative Forum Art uh, related with my grandma history, the new Pita, to the heart of my mother's childhood, the lost house, which is now the mayor um, building, the Turkish fountain, my mother's life, memory in pandemic time. So this is thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you, Lila. Thank you. Thank you. Because we know that you have to leave soon. I don't know if you would prefer that if there is any question or in a specific uh... Uh, I can stay one year, oh, one year, <laughs> one hour, sorry. <laughs> I can stay just one hour. Okay, then maybe we can continue and then yes. have a, mm -hmm. um, see if uh, others have any questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lila. Um, so now we will continue with Ana Sol Gonzalez, um, who's going to give you, he's, who's going to give us uh, an overall um, 
academic view on community museology and its critical studies. Um, and oh, okay, so we continue with you, Anna. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, I think that's working, right? Can, yes. can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, I would like to start by looking at some historical definitions of the museum that provide some insight into how the idea of the museum has shifted over time. And this section is actually based on an article by my colleague Bruno Brulon Suarez, who is the chair of the ICOM International Committee for Museology, ICOPOM, where he analyzes the museum definition process. And the idea is to explore how the museum, a European modern invention based on the values of civilization and development that has traditionally strengthened national identities, has also been, as Roland Suarez suggests, appropriated by subaltern groups as useful tools for local development and for the social negotiation of their place within the hegemonic narratives. These groups include, for example, social movements, indigenous populations, racial minorities, and LGBTQ associations. Therefore, he tells us the museum is currently understood as a plural experience appropriated by communities in their various and potent ways to preserve and transmit cultural heritage, widespread as a useful device for social change and self-determination. A crucial question here is whether we can understand this transformation in terms of decolonization. And I'm sure we'll discuss this further, but here by decolonization, I'm referring to a process of reshaping, uh, recrafting or redefining the museum in response to political and, uh, to a political and ethical challenge. So let's begin with the late 1950s. The museum is a permanent establishment administered in the general interest for the purpose of preserving, studying, enhancing by various means, and in particular of exhibiting to the public for its delectation and instruction, groups of objects and specimens of cultural value, artistic, historic, scientific, and technological collections, botanical and zoological gardens and aquariums, etc. A definition that, according to the modern Eurocentric elitist idea of the museum, prioritizes material collections, educational value, and encyclopedic classification. Now let's look at the definition proposed by the Roundtable of Santiago de Chile in 1973, which concentrated on the regional debate on the role of museums in relation to the social and economic needs of modern Latin America and is considered a landmark event in the redefinition process. Um, so in the screen you, you can read with me, the museum is an institution in the service of society of which it forms an inseparable part and of its very nature contains the elements which enable it to help in molding the consciousness of the communities it serves through which it can stimulate those communities to action by projecting forward its historical activities so that they culminate in the presentation of contemporary problems. That is to say, by linking together past and present, identifying itself with indispen in, uh, sorry, indispensable structural changes and calling forth others uh, appropriate its particular national context. Um, so this text, uh, the declaration put forward the idea of uh, integral museum the museum as an integral part of society with uh, an active role in the life of the community, which has been appropriated in Europe through the concept of the eco-museum and interpreted in Latin America in various forms of community-driven experimental social museums. Roland Suarez observes that the definition finally raised the question of whether uh, the neutral museum is possible or even desirable. And he notes that although the 1973 definition could be considered progressive, the focus remained on material evidence and traditional museum functions without 
any mention of intangible heritage. However, it does, it does lead to a more open and political direction. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, the French New Museology movement, led by Hugues de Barin, embraced a critical approach characterized by an openness to cultural difference and social participation. De Barin has explained this shift as a response to the nexus of political, social, and cultural uh, international forces, including civil unrest among First Nation groups, the 1968 student protests, the writings of Paulo Freire, uh, and so on. According to Rulon Suarez, new missiology was born as a promise to depart from the European universal narrative of progress and civilization. So in 1984, we have new missiology is first and foremost concerned with the development of populations reflecting the modern principles that have driven their evolution while simultaneously associating them to projects of the future. We can see how um, it still applies uh, geopolitical divisions between developed and underdeveloped countries and reproducing social and cultural hierarchies sustained by traditional museums. According to Brulon Suarez, these hierarchies create a museum marginality, a dichotomy between museums founded on community work and traditional collection-based institutions, which uh, still pervades current debates. He considers this, that this dichotomy between colonial institutions centered on material collections and forums driven by communities or the opposition between people and objects is an artificial one, a fundamental myth that needs to be unlearned and decolonized. However, um, at this point, we are still far from acknowledging the community museum, which by the 90s was defined as one that was born in, created, run and managed by the community. The network of community museums of America founded in 2000, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it later from Teresa, offers the following definition. A community museum is created by the community itself. It is a museum of the community, not generated outside for the community. A community museum is a tool for the community to affirm the physical and symbolic possession of its heritage through its own forms of organization. A community museum is a space where community members build a collective self-knowledge, fostering reflection, criticism, and creativity. It strengthens identity because it legitimizes history and their own values, projecting the community's way of life inwards and, uh, and outwards. It strengthens the memory that feeds their aspirations for the future. We can see um, an emphasis on self-determination and collectivity. As Karen Brown observes, the network calls for the community to be involved in decision-making processes regarding collections and interpretive frameworks to realize the community's vision. The network emphasizes communities, museums, grassroots and local work, focused on telling a story, building a future. It's also worth noting that Brown considers community museums exemplary in their focus on human environment relations and sustainability strategies to address climate change. Although this paradigm shift requires interdisciplinary work between museum and heritage studies, climate science, anthropology, and memory studies. In this sense, community and eco-museums often understand heritage as a process and prioritize adaptability at the local level, which means that their agenda is, as Brown says, less about preserving the past than sustaining a living culture for the future. Across various contexts and regions, community museum practice defies a fixed definition and demands a flexible approach outside of the European National Museum model. A recent survey by the EU LAC Museums Project gathered valuable data about community museums' priorities. The respondents' criteria to define a community museum include a geographical territory, a local sense of community, a local sense or spirit of place, and a shared local history. They describe the community's museum's purpose in terms of providing a sense of belonging, 
community participation in heritage studies and heritage preservation. The survey also demonstrates communities urge to tell their own stories and direct their activities to themselves as a local community rather than serving uh, the tourism industry. Reflecting on the value of their organizations, most answers mention community voice and agency and consider intangible and cultural heritage. Um, Brudon, Brudon Suarez understands the ICOM museum definition as a tool for political mediation. By defining the museum, ICOM is defining communities' terms of negotiation and participation within their nation states. The process should involve a redistribution of authority. The museum field cannot uh, ignore the current calls for structural change and political awareness anymore. The current definition adopted in 1974 and repeatedly amended until 2007 is the most widely known and replicated text about museums globally. Um, a museum is a nonprofit permanent institution in the service of society and its development open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study and enjoyment. So notice a contrasting wording. Uh, a community museum is created by the community itself. A museum is in the service of society and its development. I have also highlighted the verbs in the two definitions. A community museum affirms, builds, strengthens, legitimizes, and a museum acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits. The community museum emphasizes reflection, criticism, and creativity. The museum concentrates on education, study, and enjoyment. Of course, this museum definition is under revision and its critics demand an update decrying its limitations and structural coloniality. These are the two current proposals, um, starting with A. A museum is a permanent, not-for-profit institution, accessible to the public and of service to society. It researches, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible cultural and natural heritage in a professional, ethical, and sustainable manner for education, reflection, and enjoyment. It operates and communicates in inclusive, diverse, and participatory ways with communities and the public. And proposal B, a museum is a not-for-profit permanent institution in the service of society that researches, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage. Open to the public, accessible and inclusive, museums foster diversity and sustainability. They operate and communicate ethically, professionally, and with the participation of communities, offering varied experiences for education, enjoyment, reflection, and knowledge sharing. I have highlighted significant differences um, of service to society or in the service of society, accessible uh, or open, Museums operate in diverse participatory ways or foster diversity with the participation of communities. Also note the term knowledge sharing in proposal B. Are these conceived as critical tools to open museums to a greater variety of subjects and readings of the world? Can they function as a starting point for dialogue, negotiation and democratization? Either of these present outstanding issues is permanence essential? Who determines professional and ethical standards? Whose enjoyment? Whose inclusion? Is it even possible to reach a one-fits-all definition? And do these proposals reflect the decolonial turn in museum practice? In a recent conversation with Wayne Modest, director of content for the National Museum of World Cultures and the Herald Museum Rotterdam, and head of the Research Center of Material Culture. He spoke about the uncertain role of ethnographic and world cultural museum in the present, and whether these institutions can participate in fashioning heritage futures through the lens of creativity and inclusivity. You can find a full conversation in our book, Decolonizing the Curriculum, the third volume of the Decolonizing Museology series published by ICOVM, which is open access and available to download as a PDF. 
And I will also share a few images from The Art of Being a World Culture Museum, a book published in 2018 as part of the project Switch, uh, that's sharing a world of inclusion, creativity, and heritage, ethnography museums of world culture and new citizenship in Europe. I discussed the project with Modest, who stressed that the challenge to rethink museum practice has come from social movements, including Black, Indigenous, feminist, and queer activist groups. He understands decolonization as a reordering, a rethinking of the institution that involves dealing with the founding structures that continue to do violence. According to Modest, we must decolonize the disciplinary foundation of our institutions. Uh, anthropology, art history, whatever it is. He spoke of a uh, double bind, museums as sites where people may find themselves, but at the same time, museums entanglement with colonialism, their exclusionary practice and othering. We also discussed ways of dealing with these colonial afterlives, as he calls them. For example, uh, Brown and Pierce conception of source community work as a way of thinking about the reparative work required to make European collections accessible to communities of origin and beyond access, um, how these objects could be part of the struggle for indigenous sovereignty and futurity. Modest interest in, um, in museums investment in caring work and the idea of horizon thinking, asking what horizons of change and justice can we imagine and what futures can we build through a collaborative museum practice. He emphasized the need to redistribute museum authority and the shift that requires museums to do less talking and more listening. I also asked him about museums engagement with redemptive work. He considered whether the museum could be a site of healing that still acknowledges irreparability. He also commented on previous shifts in museum practice. Mm, um, sorry, previous shifts in museum practice provoked as we have seen uh, by new museology or the community, me uh, community museum movement. Modesty is convinced that there is no going back to a moment before decolonization. In his own words, it has shaken us so that we are now trying to understand what we must undo, what to break down, but crucially, we don't know what comes next yet or what a decolonized museum would look like. Therefore, this uncertainty demands a humble approach. Can museums become spaces that foster activism rather than simply responding and reacting to social mobilization? Modest expressly referred to the ICOM definition asking for who museums are or should be enjoyable. We discussed his, con his conception of the museum visit as an investment in critical discomfort, which refers to a site of acknowledgement where we recognize how implicated and complicit we are in structuring inequality so that we can imagine and work towards a different future. Rather than conceiving museums as bubbles of enjoyment at the expense of others, Modest proposes staging a situation where we can ask how we are implicated in historical or ongoing justice in the world today. To offer an example from a different context, I would like to refer to Gerald McMaster, director of the Wabata Center for Indigenous Visual Knowledge in Canada. In his recently published book chapter, Decolonizing the Ethnographic Museum, McMaster observes that during the 1990s, indigenous voices began influencing ethnographic museums and challenged their Victorian colonialist ways of interpretation. And he concentrates on indigenous identity in the visual arts in connection with resistance and resurgence. McMaster explains how indigenous artifacts in museum collections were historically identified as commodities, specimens, art, heirlooms, cultural heritage, or sacred emblems. However, since the 1970s, indigenous communities in Canada and the US have claimed these objects back seeking to return life to the items that sit dead in museum storage. McMaster argues that repatriation entails a critical shift where indigenous peoples challenge the authority of the museum and its paternalistic voice. He provides several examples of contemporary artists' responses to these issues in the 1980s and the 1990s. 
Um, I'm not, am I doing okay with time? Yeah. Okay, okay, so I will show you two examples. This is James Luna's The Artifact Piece from 1987, a public performance at the San Diego Museum of Man among its permanent displays. The artist who was of Puyu Kitcham heritage laid on moving for hours in a display case surrounded by descriptive placards on various aspects of his life, such as a failed marriage and his problems with alcohol, as well as an adjacent vitrine with other personal items such as books and albums. Uh, the piece makes a clear cut statement about museum systems of representation and their denial of contemporary indigenous agency and overt demonstration of the politics of looking. Its effect largely depends on the viewer who is driven by the museum discourse to treat Luna as an object. The moment the artist gets off the table, the moment that the artifact is alive, turns the viewers into the spectacle. And more importantly, at that moment, directly confronts the ethnographic connotation of referring to non-contemporary cultures that are regarded as elsewhere and left behind in a process of deadening. A more recent example is the collector, the artist in her museum by MITI artist Rosalie Fadel, where she inserts herself into Charles Wilson Spiel's painting. And I must consider the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts description of Peel's painting on their website, which begins by praising Peel's efforts to improve the civic and artistic life of his city and the young republic. He founded two art academies and the first museum in the US. The academy calls him a, a patriarch of an artistic dynasty that carried out his ideals and highlights his role in disseminating culture in the wider world. In his self-portrait, Peel reveals the wonders of his collection. His museum offered a cabinet of curiosities to instruct and entertain spectators. The cages in the background display, uh, um, sorry, the cages in the background display natural history specimens and the portraits above celebrate the heroes of the new country. The Academy's um, label also mentions the visiting family groups to echo Peel's commitment to education and concludes that the painting stands as a triumphant artistic and historical accomplishment. In contrast to Peel's self, um, celebratory self-portrait, Fable's website reflects on the artist's quest to find a place in the world and the difficulties of defining cultural identity as a meaty woman. Fable is interested in confronting stereotypes and forging new identities in the context of globalization while maintaining evolving Aboriginal traditions. To disrupt the depiction of colonial museum practices in Peel's painting, Fable inserts items from her cultural heritage, such as family pictures. She presents the photograph as a statement about Aboriginal peoples claiming, to, uh, claiming the right to exhibit their own culture and history, pushing against and repurposing the ethnographic museum's tendency to non-contemporaneity. This piece was purchased by the National Gallery of Canada in 2008. Bill and Fable's self-portraits present radically different conceptions of the museum. The traditional view prioritizes the pres uh, preservation of objects and specimens for the purpose of educational activities understood in a modern developmental and othering um, way. Fable's photograph reclaim self-determination and communities' rights to their cultural heritage. Considering the current museum definition proposals, the comparison also shows institutions' aversion to change. Even so, McMaster's research explores the emergence of the museum as a discursive space that facilitates interdisciplinary approaches, new interpretive frameworks, and modes of resurgence. Uh, for example, in 2005, his rehang of the um, historical collection of the Art Gallery of Ontario recognized Canada's visual art history predating the arrival of European settlers. McMaster's, I'm almost, <laughs> I'm almost done. McMaster's uh, curatorial approach is guided by transparency and an interest in examining the past through a contemporary lens, knowing that the past cannot be undone 
but can be revised and rewritten. He notes that in Canada, institutions have been building solid relations with First Nations, um, Miti and Inuit communities who want to co-create, live in, and enjoy a genuinely resurgent, fully decolonized future. Um, and yeah, so to conclude, I think there are reasons to be optimistic, but also a lot uh, much work to do. And these are some of the central issues in the tension between tradition and change uh, in museum practice. Um, the challenge posed by decolonization is a need to reimagine the museum and reinvent it now, but keep also changing it in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anasol, for sharing us, uh, sharing with us this historical perspective. Um, and we're looking forward for your next project uh, on uh, museums and communities. Uh, I failed to say that you you have a postdoctorate uh, thesis on decolonize, decolonizing arts, and and that you're currently uh, very much uh, doing a very thorough research on that matter. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Teresa Morales, um, who along with uh, Cuauhtémoc Camarena, uh, have been research professors at the National Institute of Anthropology and History of Mexico since 1981. And from 1985 to date, they have supported the creation of 24 communities, community museums in the state of Oaxaca as necessary tools for indigenous people and peasants to establish, to establish sorry, sites uh, to strengthen their identity and collective memory. They've also promoted the creation of community-based networks, including the Union uh, of Community Museums of Oaxaca in 1991, and the National Uni Union of Community Museums in 1994. Uh, in 2000, they prospered to develop the network of community museums of the Americas, uh, which now groups community museums from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Colombia, Venezuela, and Bolivia. Morales and Camarena's publication, uh, publications include Steps to Create a Community Museum from 1994, Community Museums in the Global Connections, the, uni the Union of Community Museums of Oaxaca, among uh, others. Thank you so much for, for joining us this afternoon from Oaxaca, and I give you the word. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Sophia, and thank you for the, organ the organization of this panel for the opportunity to participate. So I'll try to share briefly um, some of the principles and uh, practices of the community museum movement that we participate in. And uh, I'd like to start out saying that the ideas I'll discuss are not a only a personal elaboration of certain concepts, but really a collective effort of many, many people that have participated over uh, decades in this work. Community representatives, uh, young people, elders, adults, uh, uh, professionals also, uh, people from many walks of life who have collaborated. And of course, the uh, collective practices of the indigenous communities of Oaxaca. Oaxaca is a state in the south of Mexico have been central to these, uh, these ideas and practices. And as uh, Sofia was saying, there is a network that was founded in 1991 that currently brings together 20 community museums uh, in the state of Oaxaca. And uh, there is a discussion, there's contributions of the all these people to the, uh, the ideas and the concepts, the work, the practices that have been developed, which was also a seed to uh, establish an, a national network in Mexico and an international network, as Sophia just mentioned, uh, as the Network of Community Museums of America <laughs> and uh, nourished by these many, many diverse and uh, uh, potent experiences in many countries. So I, I'll just sum up some of the main ideas that uh, define these kinds of initiatives. And one of the main uh, tenets is that the communities are the ones that take the initiative to create their own museums. 
this is the case for all the ones I've been discussing, that uh, these museums are not the product of an institutional uh, initiative. It isn't a government agency. It isn't a university. It is a grassroots uh, initiative to create this site of the community museum so that these initiatives will arise from needs that the communities feel, that they express. Uh, for example, we have here an image of the uh, community representatives of uh, Santa Ana del Valle in Oaxaca with the archaeological artifacts. For them, it was extremely important for those to remain in their community as heritage objects that were very important to them. That was a need of their community. Or this other um, uh, example from San Jose Mugote of the story of how they had struggled for uh, to recuperate the lands of the hacienda. The uh, historical process of land rights is extremely important to many communities. These are stories that the community needs to tell, needs to transmit to their young people. And there are some other community museums that are uh, denouncing situations of violence. Uh, this is a museum in Guatemala, the first community museum of, uh, of that country in Rabinan. And it talks about the uh, massacres in the 80s. <clears throat> it was actually the first public exhibition of this that the government had to recognize. That this had actually happened to this extent. And they were... Uh, very brave in doing this work. So at this, the community museum is uh, a, a tool for this as well, for reclaiming these, these rights. And in these examples that I'm discussing, they are the community decision bodies that take the initiative. It isn't an individual, but rather a group that uh, then presents this idea to a collective body. <clears throat> in our context in Oaxaca, this would be the community assembly that comes together to, uh, to legitimize the projects that are recognized by the communities being valid. So that has to be a process for this kind of project to be recognized by everyone. In other contexts, this could be different, uh, be the Junta de Acción Comunal, the community council, but it goes through a process when this is a community museum that it, it has to uh, become appropriated by larger uh, instances of decision making. Community, communities then elect or legitimize in some way representatives to coordinate this effort, then to uh, when the museum is being created and then to direct and manage the museum. Uh, here we're seeing cases of the committees that are elected by the community assemblies in Oaxaca as part of the uh, system of local government where the committees are uh, carrying out this service without any pay to their community. They're being sworn into office. It's very um, important responsibility to be uh, in charge of the community museum. So uh, that is how these efforts go forward. In the process to uh, construct the museum, the themes that will be presented are consulted. They're chosen, again, by a collective body. <coughs> uh, uh, perhaps the community assembly itself, perhaps other groups that come together to discuss and to become, uh, develop a consensus around this, to build a collective process of self-representation that begins with choosing what subjects they want to present, what's important to them, what stories are fundamental to their way of life. And in this process to construct a collective narrative, a different people intervene, for example, here's the Council of Elders of San Francisco Cajonos uh, making their argument that they think it's very important for the museum to include uh, the territory uh, landmarks, the symbolic meanings that are present in the territory. Or here is another group of a neighborhood coming together to discuss <coughs> how important it is to include the apparition of the Virgin as part of their uh, community stories. And so we go through a process of defining the uh, parts of the story that the community wants to tell. What are the more important parts? What are the questions that uh, they want to address, they want to answer? To develop this with uh, different uh, people who are participating, the young people, the adults, uh, to go through then a process of research or collective dialogue. 
So it isn't an expert that will come in and conduct the research. It will be people of the community going through this process among themselves, where an expert can help facilitate the process, but it's not the one who is carrying it out. <clears throat> so here we have different examples of this uh, also in Peru of a, an exhibition of uh, artisans about their textiles and other examples here in, in Mexico. And one of the important elements of this process is that it invites collective memory to be shared between generations and uh, to reconstruct these lines of communication and transmission of memory, which in many cases, of course, have been weakened by the context of dominant society. And so here we have walking through the territory and sharing those stories in the site that really uh, help young people have a different sense of place. Another part of the process then is to take these discussions, this knowledge that has been generated and to decide how to present it in the museum. So these are other ways of going through uh, a process to decide, uh, seeing on each part of the story, how the community wants to represent that part. Is it, uh, is it a mural? Is it a series of photographs? Is it a scene that they would like to represent? Here, for example, this community in Chuxnaban chose to represent an element of how they had been negotiating with their neighbors, the land rights of their borders, which had been a very difficult issue, had created a great deal of violence and how they were able to sit down at a table and come to an agreement. So this is for them, for their internal process, it was a very significant way to show what had happened. They went through a process to represent it as sort of as a theater way, then drew it and they recreated it as a scene in their museum. And uh, so there are other tools with uh, these young people who are creating their mural or these others who are creating their video uh, and going through the creative process of creating the installation itself, here creating the, the mannequins, preparing all the elements, putting the installation together. <coughs> And here are some examples of some of the community museums. Uh, this is one Sandra knows very well <laughs> in the Santana del Valle in Oaxaca, uh, in San Miguel de Quistepec, Santiago Matatlan. And here are some of the exhibitions. This is one on the production and the ceremonies uh, surrounding the mezcal, uh, the offering to the earth. It's another part of one of the installations, this one about the, uh, the fiesta and the spiritual practices, or this mural, for example, created by uh, a, a discussion between the community elders and a group of artists of Cajonos representing how their town was burnt to the ground by the federal troops and then was recreated afterwards by the people who returned. An exhibition on the traditional agriculture or on the peasant struggle against the, uh, the Hacienda. So uh, to sum up very briefly and connect a little bit with this idea of decolonization, in this view, the community museum is exactly a tool or a resource. It's a resource for this process of decolonization, which would be to change the structure of power concerning this way of handling heritage. It's a, a tool to empower non-hegemonic communities to strengthen their identity and collective memory uh, through this collective construction of community narratives in which it becomes a right to affirm that uh, possibility to tell their own story, to affirm the rights of their territory, to affirm the cultural practices that they have a right to continue and to, to identify to define their own identity instead of consuming the identity created by others. And in this, uh, this line, we can see that memory and self-determination are very linked because as uh, communities construct their own narratives based on their own experience, their collective memory, they turn to struggles, symbols, traditions, sacred sites and practices as sources for a meaningful vision of themselves a vision that has its own center, it has a collective meaning and does not depend on anyone else. It doesn't depend on dominant society's logic 
or the approval of institutions or governments. It is an autonomous center and helps communities tell their stories in their own terms and in this way illuminates their unique path to freedom. So I'll end with that and uh, yeah, open this up so we can continue to, to share. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa, for your participation and inspiring work um, for so many years now. Um, it's exciting to uh, connect the dots uh, also with the participation with Sandra Rosenthal, who formerly uh, participated with you in, a, in the, in the uh, creation of these uh, museums. Um, so now uh, I would like to welcome Sandra. Uh, Sandra Rosenthal is an anthropologist uh, and associate professor in the humanities and social sciences at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Mexico City. Her work focuses on the ecologies and effects that emerge from state regimes of patrimony in contemporary Mexico. She has collaborated with various artists and curated exhibitions on issues related to museums, politics of display, collections and replicas, and co-directed the future documentary film, The Absent Stone from 2013 with Jesse Lerner. She co-edited the book, Museums Matters, uh, making and unmaking Mexico's national collections with uh, Miruna Kim and Susan Dean Smith, uh, edited by um, University of Arizona Press. Thank you so much for being here and welcome, Sandra. Thank you, so Thank you Sofia. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be part of this panel convened by Inland mm -hmm. and also by the, by the Fundación Marzo. And it's wonderful to intervene in the panel just after Teresa, because as she said, and you just said, it was through a very early collaboration with the, the Union of Community Museums in, in Oaxaca in 2004, that I came to be interested in the ways that local communities understand, experience, and coexist with artifacts from the ancient past. These community museums, as, as Tere just showed you, have been activating local claims to objects and questioning state heritage institutions policies that assume and still assume to a certain extent that their rightful place is elsewhere and more often than not expropriates them and transfers them to centralist museums. Although many times functioning in, in precarious conditions, these community museums um, have been really making the process of making the museum, I think today's presentation really showed this, into practices of community consolidation, memory work, and also empowerment. And she already showed you this, but this is Shandani, the, the museum that I, I collaborated with many, many years ago. Yet I, like others who have studied these spaces, uh, like my colleague Mario Rufer, also at the WAM, have noticed that they often mimic or try to comply or have to comply with the narratives, conditions, and display strategies of state-sanctioned heritage institutions. And they oftentimes do not, as I had hoped for the purposes of my research and my own romanticizations, I think, of community resistance, really question or transform the concept of the museum itself, or what such a space could do once it is open within the specific epistemologies and logics of community organization. In many ways, they're replicas of other kinds of museums, traditional museums. Despite having fostered these very rich processes of community building and empowerment, once they're opened, many times these spaces end up serving tourists or migrants from the US and Canada on heritage visits in Mexico. But many are also shut for most of the year or only opened on special occasions, or some have outright been abandoned because running them is simply unviable for a lot of communities in which they are made. The experience of many of these museums had already made me question the community museum as a form, and at least as it had materialized in Mexico, and I ended up focusing most of my research not on these spaces, but rather on the parallel ways in which communities engage ancient material culture outside of museum contexts, and oftentimes actually opposing them. This moment also coincided with many museums around the world beginning to work on repatriation of objects in their collections, um, in light of claims that denounce the colonial origins of the museum. 
Returning things to source communities became the most accepted and demanded strategy in the museum world to reckon with collections and the violent histories of extractivism, dispossession, and outright theft that characterized them. Yet even as repatriation solidified as a progressive politics in museums, it is surprising to see how little discussion there has been around where and to whom objects might be returned to and what lives and uses these objects would have once they're back in the places that they were taken from. In the most visible cases from the Benin bronzes to the Parthenon marbles, restitution has been enmeshed in legal processes involving state to state negotiations and rarely take into consideration local claims and practices. In the best of cases, when objects are returned to communities, museums often require that these objects be guaranteed a new home that reproduces their own understanding of artifacts as material objects in need of preservation. For many communities dealing with already precarious conditions, guaranteeing such spaces, let alone maintaining them, is simply not a possibility. But more than resources might be at play. In addition to community museums where I volunteered in Oaxaca in 2004, I also visited another community museum, this time in the Usumacinta River Basin in southern Chiapas in Frontera Corozal, a town in the Lacandon jungle that serves as the entryway to the classic Maya archaeological site of Yaxilán that's only accessible by boat. The Frontera Corozal Museum was built in the early 2000s as a response to the history of extractivism in the region, known for the plunder of ancient Maya sites and artifacts from, from the pre-Hispanic time past. The museum was designed to house a stela that was found in the community's lands and keep it from being taken from the, the community to Mexico City or to another regional museum. At the time, one of the community's elective representatives happened to work for the INA as a site custodian, the state institution of the of state of heritage management in Mexico. And following the discovery of the Stella on community lands and allegedly by his own wife, he used his connections with heritage officials and archaeologists to negotiate with the INA to transport and keep it in Frontera Corozal. During the endeavor, a second Stella was found, and you can see them both here in the, in the images and they were both packed in crates and transported to the community. It is important to note that Frontera Corozal is a state-crafted colony built in the 1970s, both to concentrate Chol communities that had been displaced from the highlands and given lands in the jungle in Chiapas, and to make the area a more productive agricultural enclave. The stelas were thus not considered ancestral possessions by Frontera Corozal residents, even though contemporary Chol has widely been accepted as the language that most resembles the language spoken in the classic Maya um, in ancient times. Through a collaboration with a socially committed archaeologist and state level cultural authorities who just after the Zapatista rebellion were invested in using cultural infrastructures as forms of counterinsurgency in Chiapas, the community built the museum to house the Stella, as well as several artifacts donated by town members. The museum proudly displays the artifact, displayed the artifacts on pedestals alongside museum labels and photographs that you can see in, in these images from, from, from the 2000s, written in Spanish and in several indigenous languages in the area, telling the story of these objects' discovery, their restoration and transfer to Frontera Corozal, as well as many aspects of the community's history um, over the last 40 years. However, like many of, of its counterparts, soon after it opened, the museum fell into disrepair and few people in the town visited it and not enough tourists came to guarantee necessary cash flow to, to maintain its basic upkeep. It was shut down. It was reopened in 2010, this time with a narrative centered on biodiversity and environmental conservation, spearheaded by biologists at the UNAM, the National Autonomous University. Yet even after this revamping and investment that added exhibition spaces, a restaurant and a botanical garden to the complex, specimens on display were stolen and the museum was once again deemed unavailable for the community. In 2017, it was again shut. This is the museum in Frontera Corozal as it stands today, almost 20 years after it opened, or rather what is left of it. Already not in operation in 2020, the museum was hard hit by floods that left much of the river basin, including Yaxilan and the town of Frontera Corozal, underwater. 
The images I am showing you were taken by Emilio Chapela, who's actually in the room um, over there in Kassel, um, and Eduardo Avaroa, as part of our artist anthropologist collaboration and edited by Emilio for this talk. They show the museum as we found it in May, when I returned with Emilio and Eduardo to Frontera Corozal for the first time since 2004. This was one of many stops we were making as part of a collaboration between our artists and anthropologists to go to some of the themes discussed in yesterday's panel that was born out of our participation in a project coordinated by Emilio, Lisa Blackmore, and Diego Chocano called Entre Rios that invited artists, activists, and academics like me to think through and with three Latin American rivers, among them the Usumacinta. For my collaboration and coincided with pandemic lockdown, I pieced together the histories of Stella from the river basin and their many trajectories facilitated, facilitated by and also hindered by the river. The Frontera Corozal Museum appears in this project as a site of optimism and possibility, mostly because of my own memories of the community museum as I had seen it in 2004 and also inspired by what I had seen in Oaxaca. You can see here that what we found was a very different picture, a watermark visible about a meter and a half above the floor, dry mud and layers of dust covering the objects, the curtains, the once tiled floors. Although there are no visible human footprints or marks on any surfaces, other traces point to various kinds of non-human habitation, spider webs, feathers, bat droppings and insects, but also frog and lizard carcasses encrusted in the mud and the distinctive tracks of iguanas and snakes on the floor, furniture, and display cases. Many of the latter were cracked, even shattered, with objects scattered around just as the river had likely left them once its waters subsided. It was clear that nobody, including the communi communal body charged with caring for the museum, whose representatives opened the museum for us, had come in to clean the space even after the floods. He explained to us, we just didn't know what to do with this mess. They had simply shut the museum with a padlock and left its contents, including, but not only the ancient Maya artifacts to coexist with the remnants of their destruction. This is the dismantled museum in a very literal sense. However, I propose that it also serves a little like my collaborator, collaborator Eduardo Avaroa's speculative project to destroy the National Anthropology Museum in Mexico almost a decade ago, to dismantle the museum in more theoretically productive and creative ways. Just after seeing the state of the museum and interested in telling its story without engaging in another form of one-sided extractivism that anthropologists and certainly artists are also known for, Emilio, Eduardo and I met with community representatives and asked if we could somehow collaborate with them, participating in rebuilding the museum and its displays. We kind of assumed that rebuilding it was what had to be done. But rather than taking us up on working to fix the museum, they mentioned an interest in having replicas of the Stella made to stand in the community's public space, located only a few blocks away from the museum itself. They explained that people in the community have never been to the museum, even if it opened 20 years ago, and they're not interested in it. It is valued as a possible source of income, certainly for the community, but touristics but, but tourist tickets and the consumption of food and souvenirs are not enough to even pay the, the basic bills to keep it open. Understandably for Frontera Corozal, a site with historic conflicts over land and territory with neighboring communities and escalating crime and violence, given that it is also a border town um, and the main entryway for migrants and illicit traffic of people and goods making their way to the US, the community museum and the ancient artifacts that it contains might not be a priority. The story of the Frontera Corozal Museum is complicated and it remains to be really researched. Telling this story, I think is very important, but I'm also here interested in thinking with you on its most immediate aftermath. This, this that I'm showing you here, what happened after the floods and what this scene might convey about, what, about community museums and what other forms and places, objects such as these Stella might take in local contexts and ecologies. Seeing these images of the museum might be disheartening as they challenge the ways in which we often think about heritage and its conservation, as well as how many of us like to imagine community spaces that, that are premised on return and restitution as decolonial practices attuned to collaborative forms of resistance and resilience, possibly healing the wounds and absences caused by the complicated and violent histories of colonialism. The fact is, however, that restitution and return might not simply be enough. This museum that was built to house the Stella and ensure they remain in the community was not 
built, even by the town representatives that participated in designing it, thinking of its residents as its prime audiences and users, let alone long-term managers? How would it have been designed if it was made with a sensibility and an attunement to the ties and relations that bind ancient artifacts like the Stella to the ecologies they inhabit and the human and non-human relations that they are embedded within and affected by? I also wonder if such an attunement and sensibility would have led to a museum at all or to another kind of place for their safekeeping and display. What if in the late 90s, when the Stella were found, community representatives like the one we spoke to a few weeks ago who wanted replicas made had wanted to put the ancient Mayan artifacts in one of the town's public plazas? It is very likely that the Ina would have denied this project based on preservationist arguments. Two years later, after the floods, no representative from the Ina nor archaeologists and conservators who work in the area have come to ask about, see, nor care for the objects nor the museum made to house them. Yet even within the Ina and under its authority, objects and monuments have been placed in context and subject to various uses that unsettle and even contradict the institution's own preservationist logics and in turn what it imposes on source communities. There were examples I could refer to in many parts of Mexico. Um, and in fact, I have spent the last two decades um, researching and writing about this colossal pre-Hispanic monolith that was taken from a community 35 miles east of Mexico City and placed in front of the National Anthropology Museum in 1964, where it stands to this day in the middle of a fountain in public space exposed to the elements. But I want to show you an example that is much closer to Frontera Corozal and also part of the Usumacinta River Basin. This is Stella 11. Because it now lies face down on the ground, only this side is visible. As you can see from this footage, the stone slab is covered in alga and lichens of greenish hues, resting on a mixture of dead leaves and damp sandy sediments from the Usumacinta riverbed, which in the rainy season flows right by where the stella is located. The ecosystem that is thriving on the limestone surface is slowly corroding the delicately carved inscriptions and scenes that made objects like this one so coveted as antiquities and artworks over the last 200 years, justifying their removal from the sites all over the Usumacinta Basin and the relocation to museum and collection spaces. Not that long ago, this monument stood at the very top of the area of Yaxilan known as the Small Acropolis, the highest point of the complex that can only be accessed after climbing hundreds of steps and hiking up the steep limestone hillside now overtaken by vegetation. The Stellet's current position is a result of a series of movements, some carefully designed and planned and others resulting from, ancient, from accidental encounters between the monument, its materiality, the humans trying to move it, and the river. In many ways, the Stella is where it is because of the river, its uses as a transportation route, but also because of its own temporalities defined by seasonal swells that both impeded and facilitated its multiple relocations. So here you can see some images of how this Stella was before. One of the last standing monuments on the site in the mid 1960s the Stella was removed from Yaxilan by the Ina. It was chosen by curators at the National Anthropology Museum, then under construction for its new Maya Hall, where all but Stella 11 are exhibited to this day. Indeed, Stella 11 never made it to its destination at the museum. Back in 1964, the monument, the largest and heaviest of the lot, was lowered using logs and pulleys to the river and transported on several canoes to the closest landing strip where a plane was supposed to fly it to Tenosique and then on to Mexico City. When the pilots backed out because its estimated weight would cause an accident, the Ina left it abandoned on the riverside. It stayed there for years when it was allegedly used by local women to, as a washing stone for laundry. Amateur anthropologist and documentary photographer Hertrude de Bee self-funded the Stella's transportation back to Yaxilan a few years later undergoing great danger herself and putting many people and also the Stella at risk in the endeavor. Without any institutional support, she was only able to leave the Stella as far as the river would transport it, leaving it on dry land by the riverbank at the edge of the site where I showed it to you. Dubi kept a typewritten memoir of the transfer as well as photographs, which she cataloged under the heading, 
rescuing the Stella from looters in the river in her archive. In this particular case, the looters were Mexico's institutions in charge of heritage conservation. Duby explained her reasons for this attempted, even if incomplete, return. Yaxilan was the place where she had met and fallen in love with her husband, Franz Blom, an amateur archaeologist who had recently passed away and who had excavated many of the Maya sites in the area. Blom became a sort of archaeological celebrity in the region, actively opposing the extraction of monuments from local sites. So for Duby, returning the Stella to Yaxilan was a, be a way of being true to his memory and to his own sense of the rightful place of ancient monuments. The monument's conservation was certainly a concern for Duby, but she made no mention in her notes of how its movement and relocation might affect the Stella, nor did she seem concerned regarding how to ensure its preservation once it was back in Yaxilan. I am interested in thinking with you, inspired by many of the projects proposed at this edition of Documenta, on what the places and temporalities of objects like these stellas might be. Is there a single unquestionable place where they belong in museums, or might they belong in multiple places simultaneously? How might communities, heritage institutions, and artists as well go about exploring such possibilities? I look at these specific stellas because of the ways that they have been affected, moved, and transformed by several communities, but also by the river itself, thinking through, with, thinking through this interaction between stone, water, people, and environments to imagine an otherwise that might complicate the idea that these objects belong in museums, trying to understand and accept them perhaps not as stable and contained wholes, nor necessarily as animate entities within indigenous ontologies, as has been the case with many other objects that have been repatriated to, to local communities, but as porous entities, always in flux, enmeshed in processes of becoming within nodes of relations that are not only embedded in the spaces and times they inhabit, but also affected, preserved, and also transformed and possibly being destroyed by them. Other stones that merge with the river and that are not seen as objects or monuments or artifacts at all are also preserving the traces of the ancient Maya. They are another kind of archive that coexists with the river. These are ballad rocks marked by the successive rubbings of, ro of ropes used to moor canoes over centuries of navigation on the Usumacinta River and its meanders. They stand at different points on the riverbanks, more or less visible depending on the seasons and water levels. There are also monuments made by the Maya, but their crafting blurs easy divides between nature and culture. And yet they're not valued as art, nor coveted by collectors and museums, nor efforts have been made to preserve them, even by those who study and map them. Would anyone want to put a Ballard rock in a museum? Thank you very much. Gracias, gracias Sandra, Teresa, and Sol. Thank you so much um, for the, um, all the references and the very enriching um, path that connected so many different angles on no? the question we are discussing. Um, I wonder also if uh, anyone in the room has any question or comment. It was also very um, interesting what you pointed at the end, Sandra, about uh, the, the, the agency of, the, of that stone and carved or carved by a non-human agency. It, regard, it reminded me vibrant matter by um, Janet Gill, no? very interesting reference to, to, the, to the, yeah, the, the agency of the object in itself. But um, I don't know if you had any question or anyone. Congratulations for, that, for the project. We have the chance to, to have uh, here for us, uh, here with us in person, uh, collaborate with Sandra in the project of the understanding of that um yeah i would say like um critical aspect no of the of the of a community museum that is uh, yes uh, somehow left at its own fortune and destiny no without the capacity of the community to 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 keep to keep it running and then in that sense it's uh, probably raised questions of governance i wonder what teresa uh, what this case uh, um Suggested, yeah, made made you to, to think and to consider. No? It's like uh, in uh, my experience in agroecological projects, when there has been an investment in certain equipment, and then the equipment is just 
left to, to decay no? and not maintain. It's sometimes because the process on defining you know, the need of that infrastructure was not uh, completely um, giving the agency to the community to feel that it's it's their thing. It's like a like you said, like the, when the community, in the examples you were giving to us, it reminded me when the community made in the old days a church, for example, no a church or the chapel. Uh, it was a special place for the community, and they would like continuously like keep it uh, uh, maintained and with uh, flowers, and it becomes like a new space of of uh, of yeah, of inviting um, the people with the with the place, and, uh, their identities. So I don't know what uh, you're thinking of the process of this museum. But... Yes, yeah. Thank you for that invitation to uh, reflect on that. I think you know sometimes. We have the idea that if there is a museum in a community that arises for different circumstances, we call it a community museum. But uh, that definition can be used maybe too widely because it seems to me from what Sandra was discussing that there wasn't a very solid uh, process of community involvement and appropriation from the very beginning. It sounded to me like there were other um, academic institutions that were more prominent in making this happen. And they collaborated perhaps with a certain group of community representatives. But if the people themselves said, we would rather have this artifact in our center of our community, uh, many, many years later, it sounds to me like they weren't consulted at the beginning of this project. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that a community museum. I think even what you projected, Sandra said, regional museum, sounds like the community itself didn't even conceive it as something that they really, um, was something that was theirs. It didn't really speak to their own history of relocation. And when, so it sounds like for many angles, it, it would be a little, not quite precise to call that a community museum. For example, as, as you know, the community museum of Santana that was opened in 1986, and, and you know this is 2022, <laughs> never closed. Has you know a community committee uh, that is renewed every year, and is um, with certain struggles, of course, but is is very well maintained. It doesn't have any budget. <laughs> what it has only is uh, is the dead, the commitment of the community to elect uh, uh, the people that will that will work on that, and they're the ones that also find funds to be able to maintain it. So uh, I think it really, that's for the determining factor, who is really appropriating and creating the initiative from the beginning and sustaining it. So yeah, that, that would be um, uh, a characteristic that sometimes is too loosely used to call some museums a community museum. Thank you. Sophia had a question or comment. Can you hear me? 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 Can uh, was the aesthetics of of the community museums? It, it, it's more regarding to how how the, the the community museums that you showed us, Teresa. Um, I think they were super exciting in the in, in the way um, you've uh, managed to detect uh, more effective ways in which the community can be involved and in in really appropriate the building. Um, but it also when I when I saw the pictures, I it, it resembled to to the official museums in a way, and it was sort of mimicking uh, some sort of um, ethnography uh, that that it's been fostered by by like the, the central institutions, and I don't know, and it is a question if it's responding to you know, the tradition or, or these, you know, the, the education or the, the or what the community have seen or from where they get this aesthetic or this way to organize a museum. Um, and how can be more of, um, 
aesthetically speaking, uh, much more correspondent to to their to their way of thinking, the, the, the way of life. Uh, in, in, in Liliana's participation at the beginning, it was very interesting to see how, uh, for example, that community museum that didn't even have um, uh, information of, on the pieces. Um, I wonder if that's an artistic project or, uh, or, or it actually responds to the community um, wanting not to have the, the um, the information on the pieces that that's a question I mean because that museum also seemed to be much more of a, a project of one artist and and trying to you know his own interpretation on the community which is also you know something that you question uh, but aesthetically speaking I don't know how can be like how can we build better bridges or if it's only us expecting not to see that anymore or like we have that you know that bad uh, memory <laughs> of those kind of museums and seeing that done by the same communities. Um, it's kind of, you know, I don't know. I, if, I don't know if you want to comment on that, with you, Sandra, or Teresa, or Anna Sol, I don't, it's an open well, I can say something, I feel like I can say something briefly and then by others to, to speak to that, address that question. Yeah. Of course, when you know community groups come together and uh, have ideas about how they can represent the different parts of the story, the, what they can think of is, is informed from what they see in the media and what they might have seen in another museum. It might not be, uh, as you say, what someone like you or the people on this panel would like as an aesthetic that's different or that's more artistic according to you know, some more uh, contemporary uh, ideas. So I think, quite frankly, that that um, isn't really the most relevant aspect of a uh, community museum. The, uh, the aesthetic or if, you know, if that uh, particular presentation is uh, more aesthetically pleasing to some audiences or not, <clears throat> if it's what the community has gone through a process and developed, the important thing is who is deciding, who is deciding for that to be there. Uh, that is more significant than, um, than having it conform to certain aesthetic criteria. As, as you say, you, know, you can have a, a, a specialist put together a museum like the one that we just saw and it'll fall apart because there isn't really anyone invested in, in making that a strong uh, site. Uh, so the, the decision making, the appropriation, the, um, the real ownership of that site is what is much more significant. And Sandra was saying, and of course it's true, many community museums go through cycles where they have uh, weaker moments or stronger moments. Um, a, but for example, there are projects that I think it's not quite the best criteria to judge a community museum by its, its exhibitions because that is, one, I mean, that is one aspect. But the, the action that it has in the community, for example, the community museums in Oaxaca have projects that they've developed over many, many years. So it's not only the exhibitions, groups that have come out of that of to uh, revitalize dance, theater, to recreate uh, uh, buildings in the, in the community or a recent project with young people to continuously research and represent their own community culture. Uh, by interviewing elders and learning about their own territory. So these are dynamic projects that uh, arise because the community museum is a permanent institution in their community. <clears throat> so it, it goes beyond what's just there in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. I think I, I would, I mean, I, of, of course, that is absolutely right. The museum in Frontera Corozal was made under a very different process and with a very different logic. And I, I tried to sort of point out to why, why also it was very well funded. As you saw from, from the images of when it opened, it was a museum that had a lot of resources that had to do with the Zapatista re rebellion and what was going on in Chiapas in the late 90s and early 2000s. But what I, what, but what I do, um, what I wanted also to highlight is that uh, a lot of the, pre in, in Mexico, pre-Hispanic objects 
belong to the state. They belong to the state, they belong to INA. And in order for them to be placed anywhere, they have to be under certain conditions. And the INA imposes this even in community spaces like the ones that 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 it has worked with and, and knows. They have to be in display cases, they have to be in places that, that can guarantee their preservation. And so what I wanted to show is these contradictions that, that these heritage institutions have, where sometimes these forms that mimic the museum, it's not even that, that the communities are not you know, abiding to our own perhaps interest in, in form or, or in, in kind of re rethinking the, the display or the ways in which these things are displayed. It's also that they are imposed certain, certain criteria that actually um, the own institutions that handle heritage don't abide to themselves. So I wanted to show a little bit of, of those contradictions. And, and what happens if we think of these objects differently as, as not museum pieces, as something that could be just put, you know, I, I showed you the, the images of this Stella in Yakshilan, and I just interviewed the conservator that, that is in charge of, of taking care of all of these Stellas in all of the sites in Chiapas. And she was telling me it is the best conserved object in Yakshilan, the one that's by the river and that, you know, when we see it and it's all full of, of algae, we say what well, this is probably being deteriorated. It's actually less deteriorated than a lot of the other um, objects that are that are on these sites. So I think that's also, I think we, that there are there are ways in which we can understand some of these objects outside of this museum logic of stabilization that I think are are really are really compelling. Um, can I can I add something? Um, yeah, I mean all of these different examples that we have discussed throughout the session. I kept thinking about this idea. I think it's by um, Brazilian anthropologist uh, Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, the idea that there's uh, many worlds in the world, and if we think about uh, decoloniality, at least in the Latin American tradition, where we understand um, modernity as a point where, you know, Europe understands itself as the center of the world and the now of history. Um, this is where I think it's so important to question the notion of inclusion uh, in relation to museum practice, uh, because, you know, decoloniality then would imply uh, imagining all the different kinds of museums that belong to the different worlds and might might not even be called museums anymore, you know. Thank you. Here's Emilio who wants Hi. to. I just wanted to add something uh, really quick that relates with with a uh, with a river. I mean, uh, this is one of the reasons I'm uh, collaborating with with Sandra, and I'm very interested in how. The, the river reclaimed, so to speak, the museum or flooded the museum. And, and I think it's very important, apart from, from uh, reflecting on cultural heritage and all these things that, are, that are, we are sort of concerned um, as humans, um, also think about our relationship to the river and climate change. And there's a, a pretty, uh, there's also a violence in, in not, con and, and uh, and, and a need to decolonize uh, our relationship also with the, with the environment and with the river. And, and so I think it's a very important question to, regarding museums. I think I'm not an expert on this in any way, but um, to consider and respond to uh, these other sort of uh, manifestations and forces. So I guess if one would rebuild the Frontera Corozal Museum, it should be under the assumption that it's gonna get flooded. And it, it should be designed in response to that, regardless of who, who's designing, you know? And of, and of course, someone, I, I, this, is, this is what I'm assuming, someone from the community that understands how the river behaves perhaps it's, it's it's that's this is a question it's better sort of um um i don't know it's a uh, it'll do it better i guess but um so this was so it, this this ecological concern in terms of of museum um 
design, I guess. Thank you, Emilio. Um, yes, I mean, in, in uh, the question that I, I first uh, um, did about the aesthetics, it, it meant much more that uh, it's, uh, it's how we, through the community museums and empowerment, we could, on, we could also be challenging these uh, ideas of heritage, these ideas of how and what we protect. And of course it's them who have to be the, the ones who direct that, who, who preserve that, because otherwise it's uh, unviable. Uh, but can, can there uh, be any other ways, any other forms of uh, appropriation and self-representation and empowering them in, in, in these matters? Um, it's an open question, of course, and it's not, it, it was not a pre preoccupation of how the museum looked. <laughs> Just wanted to, to make that uh, little parenthesis. But um, I, I would, I would just intervene and say, you know, I think part of, part of the conversation needs to be who these them are, because each community is so different. And I think that, that one of the things with thinking about community museums is that we kind of always block them into one thing. And communities are, are sites of collaboration and cooperation, but they're also sites of conflict. They're also sites of incredible violence. They're also sites of, of uh, discussion and debate and, 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 and very, and, and, and very different logics. So uh, a community in, in Chiapas in Frontera Corozal that was made in the 1970s and a community in Oaxaca that's an indigenous community that has been functioning on usos y costumbres for, you know, uh, I won't say time and memorial because that's not true either, but I, and, and, and in, in this regard, I think that, that there is a desire within the art world and within also the academy to, to think of communities as always collaborative, as always united, as always, and it is our own romanticizations, I think, of, of a lot of those logics that are at play. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if there are further questions. Yes, there is any other comment or question. We are um, approaching the end. We know it's also the early morning there in Mexico. So we thank you very much for uh, being with us on Sunday. Um, I think the, 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 the debate and the discussion and the conversation should continue in some way. Let's see um, how we, if we do it. Uh, in one hand, because uh, Fundación Marzo through Tierra Norte is working with the idea of a community space, and it might or it might not take at some point the the space for to reflect on on the, on the Raramuri culture. In our case, in inland, what we are trying is to rethink the place of the artist and how contemporary artists could be also engaging with communities and create those hybrid forms of like sort of village artists that is bringing also uh, uh, bridging the languages from from the art studies, contemporary art, as well with to, together with the with the uh, forms and visions and, uh, and ideas that the that the village wants to transmit. I was really struck, struck and I like a lot that the museum was about, for example, the process of gaining access to the land, as Teresa was showing. So this is like a an, a, an item, a subject that for them you know, it deserves a museum uh, a space, a museum room, a representation, and. Um, and here in uh, in uh, in document, I think that the whole discussion and debate it's not only about decolonizing a whole art exhibition of this kind, but also projects and art collectives that not they are not so familiarized or not used, but they don't usually work on uh, exhibition formats. How they are yes, like uh, bringing about the process and their contexts, and that way, as you say. As you said as well, Teresa, being legitimized by their own agency, no, and not expecting like a, an external legitimization. So um, I think that uh, Anna Sol, you had to help us very much to have a, a, a better understanding and a, and a genealogy, no, of this way to start to dismantle the museum in a reconstructive way or regenerating the museum, maybe could be a better wording. And yes, uh, thank you so much because it's really as I was saying at the core question of many of the inland projects 
We work in 22 villages around the country, and in many cases, after the process, process-oriented and uh, co-creative uh, methodology that uh, mm, that we follow, there was an exhibition, and in some cases, the exhibition ended up proposing, for example, the Little Museum of the Commons in one of the of the villages, or a or a museum of mourning in another village that was in a peri-urban area, and then. By creating just an empty space, the neighbors starting to bring objects that related with the rural memory. So, yeah, just a, a, a way to to think that it still has a potential, and uh, and and maybe it's just uh, our the challenge is how to yeah, how to how to reinvent and rethink what we inherited. So we could leave it here. The conversation has been recorded. It would be also available online for the ones who might not have been able to follow us. And uh, yes, well, les deseo muy buen día. Muchísimas gracias de nuevo. Y espero que nos encontremos en persona en una próxima ocasión a Yahuaca. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh? Adiós. Gracias.